This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is Antonio Vivaldi. It's another in my shows about classical musicians. My guest is Olivia Fares, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is classical music. The specific subject is Antonio Vivaldi, and Olivia Fares is my guest. He's a musicologist, he's a dancer, he plays all sorts of instruments, and he will be guiding me and the listeners through his uh, opinions about Vivaldi, his career, his life, and whatnot. So, Olivia, let me just ask you, if you could take a few minutes, give a little bit of background about yourself initially, and then also what uh, about Vivaldi has struck you and why he resonates with you. Yes, fine. So, uh, actually, yes, my, my, let's say, my relation with Vivaldi started very long ago. I was still a child when actually my parents that um, kind of hated classical music uh, were kind of hiding like classical uh, discs, classical recording in the house. So I found these discs and uh, I just listened to that. And among them was uh, the first season of Vivaldi, of course, and of course uh, something of Mozart and Bach, and I think I think yes, a Stravinsky composition. So I listened to that. I was maybe around eight or something like this, and uh, it was like a real uh, revelation to me. Suddenly, to all these sounds, all these things. And so, um, in a certain sense, I had to do not to hide, but to to develop myself, uh, let's say, a research already with this age to get new recordings through my friends, etc. Because my parents were just telling me, like, please stop this music for old people. Uh, anyway, so I was uh, asking my friends to give me some recordings and stuff like this, and I could notice that there was a lot of Mozart and Bach, etc. But Vivaldi, I was, uh, I could see that there was a lot of numbers around the, the four seasons, but actually many, many, it was very difficult to get other recording uh, than the four seasons. So I was very curious because his music actually was so special to me, was a straight, um, actually was very descriptive, uh, was really um, uh, moving a lot of things. And the, the, the guy was very curious. So with the time I just discovered he had, he was living in a very special place, which was called Venice with a very strange way of living. And uh, so I was already studying in Paris then, uh, I was in the conservatory, and um, suddenly but I, I started to, to try to find recordings, and really I discovered the catalog, his catalogs, I was around 14, something like this, and I started to see that a lot of his uh, music actually was still not recorded, and uh, some of them were quite uh, were in it still, and uh, you had to go in some bibliotheques to, to see the scores. So this is when I started a little bit to go around and uh, check these manus manuscripts around. And uh, then, of course, I discovered a guy, I discovered a manuscript with a, a hand, somebody write, uh, writing, cancelling, changing things. And I discovered the whole world around, around the body, which was so fascinating. And so with some friends and uh, slowly we started to play this music, which was not known. And uh, after I had to meet very, very important musicians with who I was able to make some very nice recordings, a little bit like, uh, let's say, uh, Vivaldi was, of course, his music was always a, a great inspiration, but it was a re uh, uh, the pretext to, to understand that there is so music that we don't know that is just uh, there, uh, hidden in some bibliotheques, and there is so much to discover and uh, actually to develop and to research. Um, let me just ask a, a broad question before I... I dig into Vivaldi, because you look like you're about my age, or a little bit younger, perhaps, and so you would have grown up, uh, you know, people your age listening to rock and roll and whatnot, and I remember when I was a child in the early 70s, I had a music teacher at my school, and he said that uh, he didn't think that rock and roll w would last as long, that classical music was the more important and greater music, because it had more complexity and more richness, more depth. Uh, and that sort of thing. And, you know, then as a child, uh, I didn't really think much about it, and even as I grew older. But as I've gotten older, one of the reasons I'm doing this series is that I find that the Mozarts and the Beethovens and the Vivaldis, and I did a show on Satie, that their music really lingers with you. That's not to say that the Beatles or Led Zeppelin or, or some other stuff doesn't have good stuff, but I don't think there is the richness and the resonance psychically in the memory the way that the four seasons. I mean, you hear da 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 da, and immediately that opens something up. And I'm not saying that a great guitar riff like uh, "Smoke on the Water" by Deep Purple doesn't have that to a degree, but I don't think it 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 
it sort of like gets in your soul and then spreads out totally. What do you think uh, is the power of classical music in general? And what about Vivaldi's music in particular do you think has that resonance? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, what I think uh, now, because of course Vivaldi is my specialty, but I, as a musicologist, of course, I had to to to, to work on many many musicians, uh, 18th century before, of course, to understand things how things were actually evolving, or uh, 20th century, and of course uh, the fact of pop music, because of course today we think that classical music is something only is kind of an opposite of pop music. But we have to think that, for example, you were like singing the spring, the spring first theme, but uh, this theme is actually um, is a dance, is a pop dance, a folk dance. Mm. Uh, Vivaldi maybe had invented it, but you had many, many dances like this. And actually you have to understand that particularly so Vivaldi and Baroque music were using a lot of ingredients to make music, not only composition as we think today. They were using dance and maybe a music they were listening the afternoon uh, in the street, so like this in the night, people listening to that in the concerto could remind what they what they felt in the day. So uh, there are a lot of images that they were using. Even sometimes they were using like uh, bad things, uh, in a sense, uh, noise, like Vivaldi in the Four Seasons making a, a dog bark. So many elements that, of course, if today we just consider that as a composition process, we actually lose a lot of the power. And I think we, we can find the same when you find, for example, the Beatles using the Marseillaise, the French hymn, uh, or references which are, uh, of course, you need to know which ingredient they use to really appreciate actually the creation. And in this in this sense, I think uh, Baroque time is very close to uh, music creation today. So um, I, I would um, I, I would not make like such um, a wall, let's say, between pop. Mm and cult music, mm. particularly in this in this time, but actually even in the 19th century, you have many examples of the importance of folk and popular music, dance music. But uh, it's more, the question is more like, if every time, every, of course, Vivaldi is not rock and roll in the sense, the rock and roll is something very precise in the time, in the evolution, because of the instruments, because of the society, the melting pots, etc. But uh, of course, uh, music has the same rules. You play with sounds, you play with structures, you play with feelings, you play with uh, effect, with, you play with people, and maybe, of course, sometimes you adapt just to context. Mm. Uh, Vivaldi was writing, uh, if you make a like, statistic of his work, he, wa he almost wore, uh, uh, you almost wrote uh, uh, a movement every day. So it's a huge production. For him, it was not so important to make a... Uh, the last tune. It was just important to make a, a good music for the moment he needed to have. So there is something of uh, an adaptation in the music through interpretation, through uh, the people he was playing for or he was composing for, which is very important to consider. And actually this problematic can be really found in, in all the pop music you have today. So we should sometimes just change a little bit the way of um, approaching this music just to get to appreciate it more. Vivaldi is, of course, lived 300 years ago, and we are very, very far from his world. Particularly, Venice was a very special place, which has no comparison in history. And um, so, it's, it's in a sense, it's a bit utopic to think we can we can appreciate his music the way it was appreciated at the time. But his music still today uh, can call our attention, and this is what actually is very interesting. In a sense, it is still a contemporary music. And we have a contemporary uh, way to interpret it. Uh, the thing, the most interesting is actually to try to understand the most of his creative process, to really, uh, so, just to open doors, just to get new tools to appreciate music in general, from his time or even today. Uh, actually, the neoclassical time was very inspired by Baroque music, or lately many, many orchestras, or many, many even pop uh, pop ensembles try to use old uh, instrument to play. I mean, it's just a font of inspiration. And of course, people like Vivaldi, like Bach or Mozart, were such great musicians that they offer a lot, a lot of reflection on the music in general. Uh, I guess the thing that that I, I was trying to make was that, for example, with rock and roll, or even with jazz, you have the constant percussive beat of the drum. And when I listen uh, and you know, if I listen over and over to a CD, 30, 40 minutes or whatnot, uh, 
I find as I get older, I get more bored just listening to it. Whereas if I listen to a Vivaldi or I listen to a Beethoven, and sometimes on YouTube, for example, just to educate myself, uh, the the music will be annotated. Uh, you'll have the, the the video, and it'll say, "Now this is the first movement. This is this is topic one, topic." Two. Then they mix the topics, and then the, 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 they have a question and answer. And it seems to me much more engaging uh, when I when I listen to it, I can listen to it five ten times. And uh, for example, like the Four Seasons, or even something as simple in Vivaldi as uh, one of his guitar concertos. When I was a boy, there was a uh, a show called Sesame Street. They did this sad flower film where you hear do 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 do, and even just that little, just the one single instrument is is so packed with emotion, and the and the slight variances over that two or three minutes uh, seems to me just so much more engaging now as I've gotten older than even the best pop songs. Yeah, no, of, of course. Um... Uh, it's a matter maybe of, co of context uh, at this time. Um, uh, of course, let's say today many things are, are, uh, are linked to a stress effect. Sometimes we, are don't, we don't specially speak about music, but we speak more about the image of music, um, a performance through music or an idea through music. But music, uh, of course, is not maybe the same uh, way uh, to be played, to be used that it was at the time. At this time, of course, you had the professional music, but many people were playing music in the streets, in the in the families. You didn't have TVs, you didn't have shows to see. You had a lot of things to to do yourself, actually. And actually, Vivaldi uh, grew in a very popular uh, entourage. So he was from the beginning like he had to play in uh, weddings or uh, for birthdays or anyway in, in very folk folk things in the street, traditional. Uh, ceremonies, etc. But the music at the time, of course, uh, was growing through a real, um, a real a complex background, particularly in Venice, where you had a lot, a lot of folk traditions, but you had the opera, which was emerging. You had uh, very intellectual people that had published a lot of, uh, a lot of documents, a lot, a lot of research, actually, uh, around uh, the complexity of harmony, the complexity of tuning, um, so you had really different pulses that were all considered. And this is why, of course, the structures, uh, in a sense, are more complex, because they play with much more reference than sometimes today, where actually the, the, the result is more based in just an experience. We put somebody, another one, just play and let's see what's out, and it's great because you're famous, and uh, it's just great like this. At this time, of course, uh, the studies were more complex, and you had, of course, interpret like Vivaldi himself. He was a showman too. He was going on stage sometimes just because the opera was not going on, so it was just entering with the violin to make people to get the attention of people again. But on the other hand, he had to work too in a, as a sacred person, so he had to use very specific tools to write sacred music. Uh, he was working as a teacher, so he has to explain a whole problematic about studying an instrument, and every day was new. Uh, you couldn't. You couldn't make like just one best song, like let's say the Four Seasons, and live with that all your life. So you had you needed every way to know what was happening to react. In Venice, music was everywhere, and the people wanted it to change every day. So you had you needed really that to be in a real, uh, let's say, um, spontaneous and very curious minds, They're extremely creative. But you had absolutely to know about dance, about theater, about music virtuosity, and about music intellect. Don't forget that in the Greek time or medieval time in Europe, uh, the music for certain people was just an, an actual scientific exercise. Um, so all this was mixed in the Renaissance and the Baroque time was a new way suddenly to, to give new rules. And we have suddenly the tonality coming up, all the forms, concerto, operas, we, uh, the violin is created, the cello, the oboe, the clarinet. The first, uh, the chamber, or the first for the piano, etc. So it's a real moment of we suddenly have new rules. It opened so much streets, and but it became such a chaos in the sense that, of course, after that we needed a, a more a classical time with treatises to formulate precise rules. But of course, it is a very complex moment. Um, today, maybe we we are a little bit more looking what works. Uh, we want we think always about the public reaction but in a, in a commercial sense, in a massive sense. And this is why maybe sometimes we, we can find that some pop, some jazz or some, 
is a little bit easy compared to, of course, the last quartet of, uh, of Beethoven or the conception of the concerto by Vivaldi. But uh, I think it just depends. It's very, you have a lot of Baroque music, which is also a very, let's say, uh, simple, grounded music. And you have a, a lot of jazz music, which is extremely complex and full of musicians, which have an extremely sensitive uh, way to, to live music. So uh, it's, uh, it's more, once again, it's more uh, the fact to Vivaldi or people like Beethoven or Stravinsky or a lot of these classical, let's say, musicians offer a, a very interesting view on the problematic of music. But I think you have also very, very interesting case in the 20th century folk pop and folk music through uh, people, personal problematics, which are very, very particular too. Um, so, in a sense, Vivaldi, uh, oh, it's not just, okay, after jazz, I'm going to appreciate this. No, I think appreciating Vivaldi, suddenly you can start to appreciate things in jazz that you maybe didn't see before, but they are inside, because it comes in a certain sense from this. Okay. Well, let me uh, let's stick with the, the music aspects of it, and we'll talk about Vivaldi the man a bit later on, since we I think we're onto some interesting things here. Let me just ask you: uh, This is the third or fourth show that I've done on classical music, and the other people that I've interviewed, uh, a handful of people, none of them have been actual musicians. I believe they've been uh, teachers or or composers or. Uh, or a the musical theorist. You actually do play instruments. So let me ask you about the difference between dealing with music in the mind and actually having it flow through your body, through your fingers, uh, if you're pulling the bow. Um, is there something, for example, that draws you to Vivaldi's music? And I don't have a musical vocabulary. Is it the way chords change, or the way some, you know, is, is there something unique about Vivaldi that, that just makes your body hum, if you will. Yes, yes, of course. Well, Vivaldi, of course, is a, uh, in this sense, is very particular. It's true that Vivaldi knows how to make instruments sound. Let's say Vivaldi is very tricky to play. Uh, you need, actually, to be a very, very good musician if you want to face uh, his highest uh, concertos and you know, the four seasons or whatever. But uh, the musical effect is always more interesting than, actually, the technical difficulty. Uh, sometimes he's able to make believe people that it's very hard with actually very, very simple things. Um, so there is a big physical pleasure uh, playing Vivaldi. And it's true that um, when you reflect, you read things and you read about the concepts, about how the way they were improvisating, ornamenting, or uh, the way they were working, and you understand a lot, of course, uh, how to read uh, this music, the Vivaldi music, what is the concerto, why suddenly he put somebody alone, just be, uh, be in front of a group and try to make this relation between individual and collectivity and in so complex situ musical situations, of course. Um, but of course, there are many things that uh, you can understand just once that you have an instrument on you. Um, it's true that when you start to play Vivaldi, some things appear uh, when the sound is there. Uh, suddenly you, you feel you feel a, a bass pushing in this way, so you are going to react in this way. But I think actually this is part of the, the way to interpret Vivaldi. You have to understand that he was very elastic. Uh, when he was playing himself, he was playing in a way, but he had a lot of students, and for him it was not a problem to adapt things to, to make them play in, a, in, a, in the best way they could. Uh, for him, music is, of course, the composition, but it was also who was playing. And he was very lucky to have always around him very, very good players. So he could rely on this. And sometimes, of course, changing some, some things if it was needed just to put more in evidence the art. So there is a physicality in Vivaldi that you can sometimes even recognize for who he wrote the pieces because uh, the way to move the hand, the way to move the bow, the character, these are very linked to very precise persons. Um, I wanna, I'm going to use a non-musical metaphor because, as I said, I'm, I'm not a musician, so I don't know the particular vocabulary. When I've spoken of, for example, Mozart, Mozart, when I listen to Mozart, I get the sense of uh, looking up towards the heavens and whatnot. When I listen to Beethoven, I get this sense of a almost like punk rock. The, I, I said in an earlier show, he's like King Leo wandering on a heath and dealing with his internal struggles. 
And yet when I listen to Vivaldi, I get something totally different. Uh, there's a famous uh, line uh, from Ralph Waldo Emerson where he goes, and I became a transparent eyeball and everything around me suffused me. And, and I, I get the sense when I listen to anything from Vivaldi, whether it's a guitar concerto, the Four Seasons, or anything else on a two or three hour YouTube uh, uh, video yeah. where he, he, the, the best of Vivaldi is playing, that there's something fundamentally, I don't know, naturalistic, that, that Vivaldi's music puts you in an environment where you are part of the soundscape, the, the thing. Uh, and it's not looking at the heavens, it's not internally, but you're part of the whole in a sense. Um, again, yeah. I don't have the musical vocabulary, but I, I think you might get what I'm talking about. What is it? Is it his use of, I mean, technically speaking, is there some reason that I might feel that or someone might feel that? Yes, actually, uh, of course, you have different kind of, uh, of personality and people and, of course, yeah. of musicians. Uh, of course, when you compare like Mozart and Beethoven, let's say like the, the two big pillars of uh, the classical Occidental expression, uh, you have the feeling that, of course, for Beethoven, uh, he was, when he was young, his father obliged him to play, obliged him to be a prodigy child. Uh, it was just telling he was 12, but in reality he was 15. Um, so there is from the beginning a real frustration. The father wants his son, so uh, Ludwig, to be as to be a new mother. But of course, it's not so natural. And on top of it, after Beethoven is just death. Uh, so that's for a musician, of course, there is something very special here. So in Beethoven, you find a lot of frustration in a sense. Uh, so that explains his relation to forms, his relation to harmony, his relation to the audience. Uh, there is really, um, let's say, a faith in him, in his art, which is which is actually uh, led by um, by force, by frustration. And you, of course, he's reaching the highest uh, mountains you can you can imagine. But you have the feeling that when you rise on top, Mozart is just sitting there, and you don't know how you don't know how he went up. It's true that with Mozart, you have straight this feeling of of amplitude of easiness, of wideness, uh, but you never see, in a sense, his, his cooking. You never see his, uh, yes, his kitchen. Uh, with Bach, with Beethoven, it's different. They, they really look for new tools to, in a sense, build new things. And to go back to Vivaldi, I think Vivaldi is this part of, of composers, of course, in proportion, which are, have nothing to be compared with uh, the late classical time. But uh, he's, he's a guy that is able to feel, to feel a very particular atmosphere uh, and to straight be able to traduce that in terms of notes. When you take Vivaldi manuscript, in general, he writes straight. Uh, there is almost no corrections. Uh, or when there are corrections, sometimes it's just like it changes completely his way. He said, but how can he prepare this before? But he's just in a such in a, in a spontaneous way of expression that... Um, his faith is so evident that when you listen to him, he's so dialectical that you straight follow him where he wants. And in this sense, he's re it's, re it's true that Vivaldi is a real expressionist. He feels and is straight able to, to transcribe what, what actually is going through his mind. To what degree do you think Vivaldi's uh, profession, from what I can tell, uh, he was, I, was he actually a priest? Uh, uh, what was his religious beliefs and how did that affect his music in its approach and in its actual uh, composition? Yes, so yes, he was a priest. Uh, probably he studied the, the priesthood because uh, well, his family was very poor and uh, as he was the first guy of his family, he was uh, traditionally, they had to study priesthood. But of course, on the other hand, uh, his father, his father was also violinist and he was a very good violinist. Um, and of course, probably from the beginning, he showed how to play to Antonio, and uh, he knew that for him, the only way suddenly to, to get a real, let's say, social recognition was to have a, an official statue. So the only way to go out, in a sense, was a price to study. Um, Vivaldi actually was priest, so he, he, he said mass several times, but actually he was, actually was feeling very, very not comfortable when doing this uh, when doing this work simply so he, he had to sometimes once he fainted he had to leave uh, the mass in between so suddenly they, they they asked him please drop that go on with music uh, that's 
Okay, we don't need you to be a priest like this. However, Vivaldi all his life uh, was considered a priest. So for him, I think the image of a priest was very important as a social person, knowing he was coming from a very low uh, social level. Uh, social situation in Venice, um, and of course the aristocratic, aristocratic uh, let's say, uh, society in Venice never really let him uh, open him the real theatre, the real possibility for him being a priest was a real, let's say, important and social image. He played once in front of the Pope and he was very, very happy about it. And um, all his life, actually, everybody was calling me Don Vivaldi. So probably all his life he was putting in evidence that he was a priest. You can feel in, uh, in sacred music some very particular uh, inspiration, actually, that you don't specially find in his instrumental music. Um, we don't know a lot after about uh, Vivaldi's way to leave religion. But for example, Gordoni once met him and he speaks about him reading the Bible and uh, getting a little bit, uh, suddenly throwing the Bible away because he wanted to write some music, but still uh, putting in evidence somebody quite close to uh, to actually like a uh, very uh, religious, uh, religious dynamic. Uh, Vivaldi uh, and some of the other composers that I have done and will do uh, are all lumped under the term classical music, but uh, you had mentioned the term Baroque, there's Romantic and a few other terms. Uh, Vivaldi is considered a Baroque composer, is that, or he was in the Baroque period. What defines the Baroque period versus, say, Beethoven, who I, I guess is considered the beginnings of the Romantic period, and I don't know what period Mozart is considered in. What defines Baroque music, uh, though? Actually, the, the Baroque music is still when uh, you have, for example, um, okay, of course, Vivaldi is a very, very good example for this because Vivaldi was actually a very important composer for the evolution of music, uh, direct evolution. For example, when you think of Bach, which is today so famous, in his period, he was not so famous. Uh, Vivaldi was in Venice, everybody was playing his concertos in all Europe. They imitated him until late, late after his death. Even Bach was in admiration with Vivaldi, but of course Vivaldi probably never heard one note of Bach. He was in, in a very small geographic area, uh, was even considered by German as an old-fashioned kind of, of musician. Uh, so uh, it's, very, it's very important to put in evidence that Vivaldi and his time had a very a great influence on, on music. So he's a Baroque composer in the sense still he's able to use ingredients uh, which are sacred or popular or virtuosistic or even theatrical. Um, there is no special frontier between pop and uh, uh, cult music. Um, so this is why his, his way to speak um, is sometimes so ambiguous and so, once again, so elastic. This way of speaking uh, really was suddenly very fashionable in all Europe because it was full of power, full of descriptions, full of sound. Uh, he was the first to use the virtuosity as a real expression tool because he was playing violin, but he wrote very virtuosistic, virtuosistic things for the fact that the bassoon, for many other instruments that he was not even playing himself. So he's really using this trance feeling to to make to develop a, com a completely new language, even, even for the voice. And so you have the Vivaldi sold a lot, a lot of concertos in Dresden, uh, and Dresden imitated a lot his style for many years. And through Dresden and then Berlin and Hamburg, you have all this, this let's say, the evolution of the music, which was suddenly called the Sturm und Drang, like, the, let's say, in the classical pre-classical period, you still have people defending a lot the Baroque power of music, like the Bach's song, very famous, Carl Philippe Emmanuel Bach, and which was in a little bit in an opposition of uh, the French, the French uh, clearness, where everything had to do be in the same way, everybody has to dress in the same way. Suddenly, uh, with the French, the group becomes like the goal. Uh, with Vivaldi, the group is more the result of putting individual people together. Um, so this, this, and this tension after between, like, let's say, uniformity and suddenly chaos uh, will help a lot the evolution with Haydn, with Mozart, and of course after with the romantic music, 
uh, through uh, you can go to Chopin or even after Berlioz, etc. Um, but of course, uh, Baroque music is is something. If we consider that like classical music, sometimes things it's very difficult to just analyze it this way because so many things have to be taken in consideration about improvisation, about using sometimes very uh, face relation or using noise, using uh, completely anodic, uh, uh, anecdotic things in the music. Classical is suddenly very far from anecdote, or the anecdote is suddenly just inside. It's never a pretext to make a piece. Uh, so Baroque, in a sense, is a little bit more close to the real life, to the street life. Or Venice, actually, was the street life was mixed with aristocratical. So it's really close reflect of the society. With the classical music, we have more a reflection of uh, the noble, the noble expression, the French noble expression, and then the bourgeois expression that we will find in all Europe at the end of the 18th century. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the man you talked about, him uh, growing up uh, impoverished and uh, in the priesthood, and I was just looking online, and uh, apparently he had lifelong health problems as well. Um, I don't know if they were that serious, but uh, uh, do you think that uh, uh, part of uh, the composition and part of this move towards, I guess you'd call the sacred or the uh, or whatnot within the music, uh, was a reaction to him against his failing health? Uh, or how, how ill was he throughout his lifetime? Well, actually, this we don't, we don't really know. That we, that we know uh, that we had something when he was suddenly, like, one day he was uh, telling the mass and he had to, he was almost fainting, so he had to leave. And in the letter, in the letter he wrote at the end of his life, he's explaining this. He said, "Yes, I had to leave because I was really feeling bad, and all my life I had this. I couldn't breathe easily. And uh, I, now, even for me, it's, it's I'm very tired when I have to walk, and I always travel with gondola. And uh, so he is speaking about this sickness. Now we don't really know um, how much exactly what which sickness it was exactly. Probably asthma, but uh, in which proportion it, uh, it could influence his life uh, because on the other hand Vivaldi was so active so extremely productive uh, he, he wrote almost two operas a year like thousands of, uh, of concertos uh, he was in Prague he went to, to Vienna then after he traveled in Italy uh, he had to, to audition dancers he had to, to make rehearsals he had to play himself so such an energy and his music of course is full of his energy um, of course, it's not fitting very well with like image of a sick, let's say a romantic sick uh, composer. I think he probably had like a, a special, probably yes, uh, something particular that probably made him a very special person and a special way of living. But um, this was very connected to to let's say the the dynamism, the the dynam and the the freakness in a sense of the Venetian society. Vivaldi was everywhere with his mask, in a, de dealing with all the girls he had to teach in the in the Hospital de la Pieta. And um, actually, yes, I don't really see him as a sick person. I see maybe sometimes like, a, of course, a lonely person, maybe facing sometimes like problem with asthma and trying in his music to put all the energy he could be put in another way. But um, still, I think he was a, a person a, a very, very connected to the outside life. Um, you mentioned that he was uh, at the, I guess you call it the Hospital of Mercy uh, in Venice, the Hospital de Pieta, um, and it, his, it looks like he was even more famous in some ways as an actual violinist. He was considered one of the, the, the greatest violinists of his age. Was he a product of the age of patronage, and who was his patron, if anyone? Uh, you know, what, was he... Was he writing these operas or, or concertos upon, on commission, or did he have a steady income, and who, who funded him? Um, you mean, so he, he had a, a, the income. Who was, like, uh, he's yeah. living in music. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, yes, of course, he was He was a very, very good uh, player. And about everybody, actually, all the, all the relation we have about him playing is, uh, is just spectacular. Everybody says, like, it's impossible to play like him, if people coming from Germany, from uh, even Quant, which was so criticizing uh, everybody, like he was the thing that Vivaldi is just like okay, no comparison. It's exceptional. Uh, he's playing in a very harsh way. 
he's so present everybody even sometimes he's playing in a way that you cannot say it's nice it's just like you you, you cannot breathe anymore and uh, so full of passion and uh, even some brutality but at the same time a lot of contrast so um he was of course a very famous player and, and could make of course money with this uh, he was, for example, uh, the guide of Venice at the time, which was already a touristic country, uh, a touristic city. Uh, Mention his name, like say, when, when you come to Venice, what you have to see absolutely is Vivaldi playing in the opera. Uh, but of course, of course he comes where uh, he was working in this Ospedale della Pietà, which was a, a conservatorio where the abandoned uh, children were were led to to be educated, and the girls were educated to music. So Vivaldi, from uh, 20 years old, very young, he was just a priest, uh, started to give violin classes there in this Hospital de la Pieta. And he developed a very, very important orchestra, which it was already a, good, a very nice orchestra, but with Vivaldi, of course, all these girls learned so much and he wrote for them many, many music for all the voices, all the instruments. And of course, from there, uh, the Hospital de la Pieta is for some people the best orchestra in all Europe. So from this, he got like, of course, money as a teacher, and he had to compose for every month two concertos. So he was played for the compositions and for his teaching. Now he could choose. We, we, can, we can see many manuscripts of Vivaldi when he starts a concerto for violoncello and suddenly cancels the violoncello and it becomes a concerto for flute. So it's not, it was all only like on comment. Uh, he could have perfectly a margin of, uh, of auto decision in his composition. And of course, if uh, you had a noble guy coming in Venice and say, this I'm playing the flute, but Vivaldi was straight writing something for him. Uh, this is well, this is the way all, all composers were living, but until quite late in the 19th century. So, but he had a margin. He was respected and could could in a sense be, um, let's say, say okay, I feel to write this kind of music now. I'm not obliged, but I feel this. So it's it's a point which is interesting to put in in evidence with Vivaldi. Yeah. Let me talk about the operas uh, nowadays, and really for the last century or more, opera. Uh, especially in the U.S., but I think also in Europe, is always associated with being highbrow, being high art and whatnot. But uh, just looking uh, and doing these shows, it seems that uh, opera was much more a mass popular entertainment. Uh, it was sort of the pop culture of the day, uh, if I'm correct. Um, so what was Vivaldi's influence on opera? How did he, if at all, change or help opera evolve from what it was to, to post Vivaldi? Yeah, actually, yes, Vivaldi, Vivaldi, uh, Vivaldi is, is very important in the opera evolution. But the first opera, in a, in a sense, like we, we can consider it today, was actually created in Venice in the 17th, uh, 17th century, Andromeda. And so Venice was a very important place for opera. Uh, you had, um, I don't know, maybe six or seven or even more opera created in the city every year. Um, actually, Vivaldi did some things very important in there because um, in, in the uh, 1720 is uh, is published like a book called um, the Il Teatro alla Moda, so the fashionable theater. And uh, of course, the people uh, it's a pamphlet which is directly going against Vivaldi um, because Vivaldi brought into into the into the opera a lot of popular things. Actually, he's the first person to bring ballet. In Venice, professional ballet on stage during the opera, and as you say, the opera was just sometimes a pretext to make a big party, uh, a massive party, because you had the, the the folk, let's say, which was down, and very the the highest aristocratic class was just like renting the the rooms on top. So it was a real melting pot, and particularly in Venice, where everybody could have a mask on his face. So, uh, of course, Vivaldi would be so surprised to see the way opera is today. He would just stop and say, but why are we turning the light off? Uh, because actually the performance sometimes is more in the audience than on stage. Uh, why uh, during the recitative people are just staying like listening like this? Uh, he would not absolutely recognize this kind of opera today. And the opera in his time was the pretext to bring comedians, to tell stories, to play a concerto or violin, uh, to bring an animal on stage just because it was exotical and say, okay, let's see the, the, the rhinoceronte or to bring a, a bear just to make people like it. So it, every, everything was a pretext a little bit to make a party. 
the operas could be sometimes six hours long. Eh? So it was not the attention of the audience was not at all the kind of attention we have today. Nevertheless, there was of course a moment which of great uh, concentration, uh, virtuos, uh, which or composition, which are so so subtle, so extreme that of course at this moment, this magical point, everybody was suddenly. Sh uh, stopping to speak, stop, stopping to throw fruits on the others, stopping to play and to dance, and just concentrating on this magical thing, and of course maybe sometimes asking the singer to, to, to repeat it five or six times. Um, but it was very free, particularly of course in Italy. Uh, you have many, many people uh, telling telling these stories of uh, of visiting Italy and, and being so surprised by the, the, the way people were appreciating opera and the popular side of it. Vivaldi brought into opera, actually, his magic as a virtuoso. He brought uh, the colors that he discovered with descriptive music. He wanted to make effects. He was suddenly able to reduce extreme simple lines to, to just bring an atmosphere. So in this sense, Vivaldi is very, very important in opera. Until, of course, the Napolitan school is going to come in Venice and of course, be promoted by the arist aristocratic, oh, I cannot say that, aristocratical class theater, San Grisostomo, where Vivaldi could never enter. And so therefore, Vivaldi, it's a, it's a tough time, but for him, it's no problem. He knows how to adapt. Uh, so he tr suddenly tried to copy, to copy the Napolitan to make his own soup again and to make, let's say, a new life. Opera for him was probably a very, very important a way of his production. He really liked dancers, he really liked uh, effects, uh, makeups, uh, divas, and uh, the atmosphere of the theater because it was a place where everything could happen. And uh, he uses, of course, this a lot after in his own composition, even in sacred music, you have a lot of influence of this, let's say, this freedom and this passion of the opera. Um, you, aside from being a musician, also are a dancer. So let me ask you about ballet as an offshoot of opera. Uh, again, I'm no expert on ballet, but I've, I'm under the impression that what we think of ballet now, the Swan Lake, uh, the, the graceful motions, was not what ballet originally started out to be. Ballet was, again, more of a popular dance kind of thing. It wasn't as, as it, it, they could be bawdier back then. Um, is that so? And what do you... Uh, how did how did Vivaldi's music, uh, if at all, propel ballet, if at all, towards what it has become now? Yes. Okay. So, so actually, yes, that's that's very interesting to point this out because it's true that when you think that Swan Lake, for example, so let's say like the emblematic uh, ballet ballet in all the world, actually the, the choreography on Swan Lake, the definitive choreography on Swan Lake, was just established in the in the sixties of last year. Of last century, so it's almost it's it's much after Isadora Duncan, and and of course the, this image of classical ballet we have today has not a lot to see with what actually uh, where all the dance formation and the in the ballet technique and the classical technique uh, evolution. Um, Vivaldi uh, had a very very important dancer dancing for him, for example, like Piero Tosi, that after became like. The director in uh, the, uh, the French in Paris, the French uh, Royal Academy of Dance, and after actually went to the States uh, in Charleston, if I remember well, where he died actually, and imported actually ballet and French, French and Italian styles there. Uh, at the time of Vivaldi, of course, the ballet ballet masters were in general coming with their own uh, composers and music. We know that Vivaldi wrote some ballet music. Uh, because we have some manuscripts, but sometimes they were just coming with a jig or coming with some tunes to dance on. Now, uh, it's very important to consider that Vivaldi was always thinking which is a lot, a really lot, almost like today in a professional company. Uh, so that means the Vivaldi was were very elaborating. And when you see some music, uh, dance music of the time, of course, they are very uh, folk type, Jig or Paspier or, or noble, noble background or, or folk background. Anyway, you had noble virtuosity or folk virtuosity with all this Italian technique, which is fundamental in the ballet evolution. So Vivaldi really, uh, really choose a very precise interpret for ballet. And even once he is threatening, like canceling an opera, if this dancer, like Oluzzi, cannot dance 
for him because he knows she's very good and uh, the choreography of her ballet master are fantastic and uh, the costumes and without her then he prefers not to do the, the opera. So uh, yes, the, the dance at the time is, is more, uh, is less, it's like in music, uh, every interpret comes and make, proposes his own interpretation, his own choreography of, of uh, let's say, general references. Um, so it's of course this moment where you have dancers, Italian dancers going to France, French dancers traveling to, to Vienna. It's, it's a very, the moment actually where really, let's say, the basic of the classical technique is going to be done in all Europe. And in this sense, actually, it's funny to think that Vivaldi was, was a very important uh, composer for, to, to actually promote this uh, dynamic. Well, I want to talk uh, a bit about uh, his actual legacy musically uh, and through the, the last few centuries and into the future. And then I want to talk specifically about some of the individual works. Um, so when Vivaldi died, from what I'm reading, uh, not unlike, say, Shakespeare, who uh, sort of disappeared for about a century and a half until the Romantics uh, revived interest in his work, it seems that uh, Vivaldi's reputation just sort of stagnated until, I guess, Bach helped revive it uh, or, or something. Um, uh, from what I mean, uh, why why did his reputation uh, sort of wane? Uh, why did it come back? And how you know yeah. how did he become the Vivaldi that yes, is yeah. now known? Yeah, yes, it's true. There is a real Vivaldi resurrection in a sense because it's true that uh, Vivaldi was uh, for a long time like many baroque composer and even Bach in a sense uh, were forgotten um, this is coming of course from uh, its historical reasons um, when after after the baroque time where you had so many so many dynamic in all directions like virtuosity uh, uh, opera is developing uh, virtuos start to travel in all Europe and we want always something new because suddenly it's so it, it's so great this moment that everybody feels to try and to make a concerto as he wants, etc. So of course the music of yesterday, in a sense, is always is always too old. We, uh, this, this is a time of contemporaneity. People live in the moment. Vivaldi, of course, survived a little bit uh, in the 18th century. We know that uh, he was still played by very famous violinists in the, in the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. But of course, maybe his music was, for the four seasons actually, were played quite long. Uh, but his name, of course, suddenly, uh, we were speaking about Haydn, about all these new guys, uh, his name suddenly started not to be printed in in encyclopedia and particularly it was Venetian, so Italian. And there there was no real dictionary like we could have in France or in Germany, developing a real research on history or musicology, let's say musicology development. So Vivaldi, like many let's say all the Italians were completely disappeared of the knowledge of people. And it's true that uh, his music not, because you can sometimes find even in Beethoven or even some other composer references to the spring or references even to, to, to concertos that actually we are quite surprised to see that maybe still in Bohemia some people were playing this kind of music. But still, uh, it's true that Vivaldi came back thanks to Bach, because when we started to discover, rediscovering Bach again, we noticed that Bach actually uh, did a lot of tra transcription of this guy called Antonio Vivaldi. So we started to look for the originals. Uh, that was the beginning of the 20th century. And suddenly we started to, to see that actually to this guy actually wrote a lot of music and there was a lot of collection there. But it, it's a very long story to tell because some of his manuscripts went into Vienna and were lost and then after could find them again. And it was, but suddenly Vivaldi, let's say, after the war, the, the Second World War, uh, suddenly, Vivaldi uh, start to, to, to explode uh, because, of course, uh, the situation in the world for contemporary composers at the time is not so easy. After the Second World War, it's quite difficult to compose, to propose a message, to propose, uh, let's say, uh, an artistic uh, position. But this old music coming from 300 years ago, in a sense, uh, was very welcome at this time. And on top of it, we could record it. So. People started to have these recordings of concertos by Vivaldi or other 
other Italians. And it's true that in this moment, Vivaldi became in, in a few years, let's even less than 10 years, probably from he was from the, the completely forgotten state, he became one of the most famous composers in the world. And it's, of course, very completely unique in the story of music. But still, uh, his name is, is very famous thanks to the Four Seasons. Mm. Uh, but we forget sometimes to, to consider the rest of his repertoire, and uh, which is, of course, where uh, we can still say today that Vivaldi is not known. There is still a lot, a lot, a lot of to, to do, to appreciate, uh, to, like, to appreciate even more the Four Seasons, but knowing more how the man was working, how we wrote. And this is, of course, a little bit what I'm working on because we are now publishing all this, in, all this instrumental music. I'm trying to make, to develop a lot of recordings with a lot of discography here in Europe to make all this music coming, let's say, to be divulgated. And, uh, of course, it works, but still, uh, Vivaldi is a big name, but for actually in reality for very few compositions. So he's very famous, but there is still a lot of things actually to, to bring back to light. Yeah, uh, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you to speak about some of the other noteworthy works and works uh, of his that uh, are neglected. But let me ask about the Four Seasons, because that's clearly yeah. far and away the most uh, famed of, of, of all his compositions, and probably the opening notes of uh, spring, you know, da 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 Even if you don't know it's Vivaldi, if you know that, ah. Exactly. Yeah, and that's exactly. that's just that's just like the Beethoven's Fifth or the Moonlight Sonata. It's like uh, the the Nocians yeah. or the Gymnopedias of Sati. You may not know who it is, but you know it. And that's one of the things that I found very interesting in looking in, in classical music is how many times you know I'll hear so and so's Fifth Sonata in B, and I'll say, Oh, I've heard that before. And so, what what do you think it is about the Four Seasons that has propelled it? to become this really iconic uh, series of uh, uh, musical pieces above all yeah. else uh, of his that, you know, is, is like, as I say, right up there with the Beethoven's and, and Mozart's most recognizable works. Yeah, but actually I think um, if we could really answer to this, actually we would know how to make like uh, super, super yeah. selling music. Uh, but Actually, no, but there are many, many things that can explain a little bit this, too. Uh, actually, first of all, the first, the first seasons as a title, which uh, let's go back in the 50s, uh, where um, we like suddenly uh, to see people expressing it. The first season, it's the story of life. It's, uh, I, 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 okay, I come here, I, I grow, I suddenly fight, suddenly I relax, I die, and after, actually, I don't know. And actually, Vivaldi makes that very nicely because he writes some poems on top of the seasons. Yeah. That when you play the four seasons, uh, suddenly you know that you are uh, you are actually it's a storm, or you know that you are crying because you just lost all what you all your work, or you know you are just actually sitting in a in a sofa listening to the fire, or you are dreaming and, and actually a, a dog barks at you because there is a, a, a something coming around, but you are just under the the, actually the, the charm of the rivers and the trees, etc. So Vivaldi is very, very expressive on that. And it's very funny because for him the death is not coming at the end of the winter, but the death is coming at the end of the autumn. Mm. And actually the winter is the season where everything mix. He starts to take things of the spring, of the, the summer and the autumn and start to make a very, very special composition uh, where actually the, uh, when you start to analyze that musically, it's extremely complex. And uh, of course, there is for Vivaldi, even it's, it's a very particular conception to make four concertos making a whole. Uh, con he, he considered probably this actually, it was not, he didn't decide to make the four seasons. Probably it was commanded to him by somebody we know that actually it was a noble guy that had the four statue in his, uh, in his park and the four statue were the four seasons. So he has Vivaldi simply to, to make a, a musical pendant to them. But Vivaldi took that very seriously, and it's true that he made a real um, capolavoro, let's say, like a um, masterpiece of it. He really put a final point. It's, it's not a music that suddenly has to, to, tomorrow I will do something else, and today I try this, I go this way. With the Four Seasons, there is a real totality in, in uh, his proposition. Not only a squid, not only... Or just only a feeling extremely well developed, but already a conception actually, which is a little bit closer to what people were looking maybe in the 50s. 
uh, like a conceptual music, where artists have to say concrete things. So since this music, in a sense, is very fluid, is full of contrasts, full of stories, uh, rhythmic, you were speaking about rock and roll, but if you are ready to take uh, the base of all the storms, all the power, uh, you just have to take the summer third movement and you can recognize so many heavy metal days. Uh, so it's true that the four seasons suddenly could connect with so many, many kinds of listeners. And so they became straight super famous. Uh, but probably Vivaldi would be very surprised today that to people, okay, the four seasons, but yes, but the rest, uh, he wouldn't see so clear that they are so exceptional. Yeah. Uh, like maybe uh, Ravel, when uh, with the bolero, he hated the, bo the bolero, but uh, but everybody was just speaking about that. Or the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven, which is more or less an improvisation that he wrote, yeah. and in a certain sense, it's much less developed than the last sonatas. It's completely another chance. It's not in terms of quality, but it's in terms of some kind of ambition. Mm. Um, Vivaldi wrote some sacred music, of course, which has which have so much uh, musical ambition, but didn't come through um, through a way or a time that it could be presented as well. I'm sure there are so many melodies that are even more uh, powerful than the spring opening. But, uh, of course, many, let's say, almost all, the spring opening is so simple. It's a folk dance. Even probably, probably we only listen to that in the street in the afternoon and say, OK, tonight I will write a concerto with this tune. So. Um, it's, it's something that sometimes you cannot explain why things come out and other not. Yeah, it is uh, one of the ironic things that artists oftentimes, their most famed works, even if they're not the best works, are those that they do offhand or very quickly, and then they may labor on something for many years uh, and think it's their masterpiece, but it, it goes neglected. And in that vein, since you have uh, been active in... I guess you call uh, Vivaldiana uh, in, in terms of looking for his uh, through his works and cataloging them and whatnot. Let me ask you: Can you give two or three examples of works or an opera that uh, you think that once it gets out there into the public sphere is going to uh, enhance and broaden the idea that we have of Vivaldi as a man and composer? Of course, are you can of course. Uh, for example, if you take, I don't know, uh, okay, so many, so many pieces, but if you take the concerto, let's say the number 278, the, and you listen to the opening of that, uh, of course, it's straight the concerto which is going to what? To, to surprise and to attract a lot. Um, but the 2812 for violin, the concerto for two cellos, um, for, or for in vocal works, you can take so many arias. Uh, I don't know, coming from Judita Triumphans for Orlando Furioso, or uh, the sacred work. If you take the Stabat Mater, the Nisi Dominus, uh, this, this kind of pieces are, are this kind of masterpieces that straight open doors to something which is completely unique. And it's, I think, very difficult to just not be sensitive to this. Uh, the, the, power, the power of this composition is, is like the Four Seasons. And in general, in Vivaldi, uh, his way of composing was so uh, natural. He was so immersed in a, in a whole logic, musical logic, or uh, musical universe that even the composers, which are the less ambitious, still have to always have a bounce, a curiosity, or an atmosphere um, which is very, very strong. Now, of course, the duty is, is uh, the, the, the interprets today have to understand that to be able to, to make it happen. The Four Seasons, uh, probably today, uh, we did already like 5,000 recordings of that. I think it's the piece that has been the most recording in the history of music. So when we record that, we already know that before. It's different that when you take a piece that you don't know at all and you have to decide everything. So uh, you don't have the same you don't have the same myth around, even for the interpret. And I think it's it's a matter of time. If it happens, it's fantastic. If it doesn't, it's the same also. It's just sometimes, of course, as you can you can feel these things. Sometimes it's, uh, you say, okay, let's try to share that with people because there is a beautiful place to see there. And uh, sometimes we just go around with without even knowing it exists. So. But with Vivaldi, you have many, 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 many other things. As you were telling, the guitar concerto so famous and so simple, written for a noble guy in Prague, 
uh, it's who can write that in 10 minutes Vivaldi who wrote this piece and it's it's just a moment of of complete contemplation of uh, of fun uh, of uh, passion in a sense uh, everything can be mixed everything can be ambiguous so many people can find their own way all own way to feel that <laughs> Vivaldi is not a directive composer is not an affirmative is just feeling things and opening that and letting people actually react to this the way they they, they feel and this is actually one of this one of his characteristic and one of his talents actually he's defending a very very open vision of art well on that note I want to thank you for taking about an hour to speak about uh, the life and career of Antonio Vivaldi I appreciate it and so will uh, uh, viewers of this so uh, let me just ask finally um, just about yourself uh, what what are you going to be doing, say, in the next year or two, generally and specific to Vivaldi? Uh, uh, you know, are you going to be staging uh, one of his operas or participating in that, or, or what? Yes, uh, well, I have many projects around Vivaldi, but the, the, the main one for the month, let's say, is I, so I'm publishing all the instrumental music of Vivaldi. Mm -hmm. We already did the half, uh, but of course, a marathon, a marathon, because on half it's always. <laughs> more tricky. We are going fine with that, but it's uh, still a, a matter of a few years. Uh, after, of course, I'm working on a lot of uh, recordings, uh, even even sometimes the Four Seasons again, to try to get uh, new new visions about that, to try to play more with the anecdotic things of that, the picture, the way to play the violin, which was so full of sounds, was not only aesthetic. Uh, it's, the, it's difficult today to to really try to use all these tools because we still always have a, a little bit of classical responsibility that sometimes may give big breaks and to, to really understand this music. So I'm working a lot with conservatories, some university or foundation or discography and interprets to to really try to, to, to work, to, to, to record this work, to stage this work, opera or in, in a way actually which we just use more all the riches as in. So, of course, discs, so many, yes, productions, uh, all kind of concerts and uh, things like this. Well, Olivier, for us, thank you for your time and your opinions. Okay, my pleasure. <laughs>